Welcome to this special Bradley Prizes edition of Conceived in Liberty, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Our guest is Professor John Cochran. John's official title is the Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. But he's also known by the name of his blog, The Grumpy Economist. He's the author of numerous publications and articles on monetary policy, finance, the economy, and other topics, including his latest book, The Fiscal Theory of the Price Level. John is also a 2023 Bradley Prize winner. Congratulations and welcome, John. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. It's uh, both a pleasure and an enormous honor. Thanks so much. Well, John, there's no shortage of topics to talk about with you considering today's economy, but I got to start with this one. How did you come up with the name Grumpy Economist? Why do you refer yourself to yourself as the Grumpy Economist? Well, as as you can hopefully tell quickly, I'm not a grumpy person. I'm actually (laughs) very optimistic. Uh, But uh, one morning I was... uh, 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 reading a Paul Krugman pl- column uh, one Sunday morning, bad habit. And I got so mad, I slammed my coffee cup down and, and proceeded into the kind of lecture that my children had heard many times before. And so they decided to call me uh, the grumpy economist. And uh, I, I thought that was a good name. And you could see that the little cartoon for my uh, blog with the coffee cup spilling was drawn by my son, Eric, uh, in response to that incident. Well, there's certainly a lot to be grumpy about these days, given all of the economic and fiscal challenges that we face. Uh, one issue that's receiving a whole lot of attention, of course, is the is the debt limit, the debt ceiling. Uh, if Congress doesn't raise it, and I think they almost certainly will, they always do, the country would default on more than $20, $31 trillion in debt this summer. Let's try to put this in perspective for the average American. What would that mean to the people of this country if there were to be a default of that magnitude? And what are the risks of ignoring debt uh, of our government? Yeah, I I think there's an enormous risk. And I, um, both sides of here are kind of, they're they're sort of like um, bringing gasoline to a fire in order to threaten the other side that it's going to be made worse. Uh, There is no reason that reaching the debt limit has to mean a default. Uh, It simply means the government has to say out loud, we will pay interest and principal on treasuries before we pay other things. And if I were Treasury Secretary, I would be saying that out loud right now. Um, uh, There's, you know, but you can, you lose the political threat when you do that. Um, Let's remember though, so the default is both larger and smaller than it seems. Uh, A debt limit induced default is a technical uh, matter. Uh, The government, uh, if it chose not, it would be a choice not to pay uh, at treasury securities and to pay other things first. We've got plenty of tax revenue to pay it, Uh, but it clearly would be a, a deferred payment. It would not be these things are worthless bonds. Uh, it would simply be for the moment, you're not getting your money, but hang on and that money is is going to be there. It is not, we worry about default and debt crisis on the US debt when nobody will lend to the US anymore. That's not this event. It's simply a technical one of, you're not gonna get your print, your principal and interest right away, uh, but you have to wait, wait a little while. Um, now that, however, would have deep and unknown repercussions in the financial system. Um, uh, you, you might be able to say, okay, well, you know, my money market fund, I, I don't need to spend it right now, but treasury securities are used as collateral in financial transactions. You, you can pledge your treasury securities and borrow a dollar against them if you're a, a, a bank. You do this sort of stuff all the time. And you instantly can't do that if they're even in technical default, even if we know eventually you're going to get paid off uh, in technical default. Uh, so that would cause a, a real financial disruption of the sort, given the, the shocking um, inability of our Fed to see and, and regulators to see basic things like Silicon Valley Bank's failure. Uh, I don't think anybody really understands um, the the uh, consequences of that event. So that could, if it happened, uh, lead to a, a big financial problem. Now, of course, the Fed would immediately uh, take defaulted securities and give you money against them and try to float things around. Um, they should say that loudly, too, which they're not saying. But nonetheless, it, it would be a, a huge fire to put out and potentially a financial 
sector catastrophe of, of the type we haven't seen since 2008. So that's that's the danger. It's not the big default on American debt that we're, we're worried about, but it is a danger of a financial disruption. And we've just seen uh, how, how capable our regulators are of handling and, and foreseeing financial disruptions. I mean, this certainly isn't the first time we've had one of these showdowns. Uh, in the past 13 years, we've had maybe 10 of these uh, events come up. Um, I mean, a couple questions. Do these recurring threats have any impact on the economy? And and really, is this any way to do business as a country, as a government? It's not a way to do business, but it is a um, it's a it's a second best solution. Yes. Our Congress has lost the ability. We we had a budget act. <laughs> and in fact, uh, starting starting, I, I think it was Calvin Coolidge was the first one who said, look, we can't just spend money. We got to have a budget and decide here's how much we're gonna spend overall. Now, everybody can't have everything. You know, We gotta do this within the framework of a budget. And we have a budget process, which is completely broken, has not been followed in, in, in living memory. The last remaining time when our Congress gets together and said, look, there's an overall limit. Uh, so we gotta cut down here, there, never stay within the overall limit is this, is this perennial. Uh, debt uh, limit business. So I'll defend it. Lots of economists uh, say, oh, we should just get rid of the debt limit. It's silly. No, it's the last room. We, what we should have is a functional uh, budget system. So in that context, I actually will defend it a little bit. It has produced some negotiations on overall budgets, some uh, limits on, on spending, some reforms on taxes. Uh, it's not the best uh, thing in the world, simply removing the the debt limit system would would not yes. be necessarily better. I mean, there are some political leaders these days, and and some among your peers who who would say that debt just doesn't matter anymore. But I mean, that can't be true, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, of course, I'll go on. <laughs> the argument here was originally that interest rates are so low. Uh, and and like uh, like a household, like your average household who bought a too large McMansion in 2006 and said, "Don't worry, honey, we can afford the payments." Uh, our government has been borrowing because they can afford the payments, uh, and that was explicit going into this huge fiscal expansion in in the COVID era. Um, several administration officials said, "Don't worry about it. Interest costs in the debt are so low, we can afford the payments." Well, what happens when those interest rates go up? <laughs> Uh, and, and that's uh, what's happening right now. And we're beginning to see uh, that mess. So no debt does eventually have to be repaid. Uh, the technical argument that the rate of interest might go back to being lower than the economic growth rate, uh, that is a correct technical argument, but it's not big enough on, on a macro uh, scale. We might get lucky to have a growth rate of tax revenues that's say 3% and an interest rate of 2%. That would let us finance, the government finance about a 1% of GDP deficit going on, but our problems are 5% of GDP deficits. So it's just that it's a small, it's an, governments can print money and they can print a little more money every year as the economy grows. That's great, but that doesn't mean they can print money and hand it out like there's no tomorrow. So similarly, our government debt is a wonderful security. People like to hold it. They're willing to give us low interest rates for it. That has been an advantage for our government to be able to borrow. But it's not something that scales arbitrarily and says, therefore, uh, the government doesn't need to pay back its debts. And then we don't need to pay back our debts. They can just send us checks to pay off our student loans, our housing loans, and heck, give us, give us, uh, pay us incomes and we can just order everything on Amazon. You can tell that doesn't work. <laughs> that ends sooner or later. And in the end, uh, debt has to be repaid or else. Makes sense. Uh, and it's also tax season, John. Uh, and as all of us are in the, the process of preparing this year's returns, it really is a, a pretty unpleasant reminder of just how ridiculously complicated our tax system has become. Uh, you, you've been a proponent for simplifying the system, and, and you've suggested replacing it with a consumption tax, uh, which would also have the side benefit of rooting out crony capitalism. And you've taken a lot of heat for that, uh, with some saying it would create even more inequality. Uh, tell us why you think the opposite is true. I'm appalled, as you are, by the complexity of our tax system. <laughs> and and it, we, we should... 
that Trump's taxes that came briefly in the news until it was discovered they didn't fill the left-wing narrative. However, they're a good uh, parable of what's going on. 400 separate pass-through LLCs, uh, every deduction and exclusion that a real estate developer can find. Come on, people, this is ridiculous. But the bigger problem from an economic point of view, when I put my economic blinders on, which, which we all should, the main question is incentives. And what you want a tax system to do is raise money for the government. The government needs to spend some money uh, with the minimal disincentives, the minimal distortions to the economy. And our tax system is just a bloated mess of disincentives. Uh, lots of very high marginal rates. Earn an extra dollar, you keep a, a small amount of it in, in many categories. Uh, but uh, a narrow base, a Swiss cheese of deduction. So it's not raising that much revenue with lots of disincentives. Lots of businesses are just set up to avoid taxes, not to make good, good products for, for you and me. So uh, the removing the dis horrible disincentives, it, along with simplification, is, is the main reason I like uh, consumption tax. Also because a, a, a low, broad consumption tax um, – uh, that gets at the things, you know, get, get the rich people at the Porsche dealer. <laughs> if, if you are wealthy, but you've left all your money invested in a business that is higher employing people and producing great products, how, how are you hurting the economy? Uh, you know, get, get, you'll get them at the Porsche dealer and you'll get the Trumps of the world. He'll pay more taxes if he has to pay for it at the, at the boat, helicopter and Porsche dealer than if you try to whittle it out of out of the income that a uh, that a real estate uh, developer reports. Um, inequality, which I, I like to call uh, income diversity. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because it's it's not necessary. I, I worry about I worry about lack of opportunity. I want a prosperous society when people on the low end have 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 ways up, and simply you know making somebody on the low end a hundred dollars poorer and making Bill Gates a billion dollars poorer. I, I don't that helps supposed inequality, but I don't see how that helps the economy. That's just envy. Um, but I, I think uh, the key idea. We should follow is to set first of all look at all taxes together, not just federal taxes. What's the disincentives of federal, state, uh, local sales tax, excise tax, property tax, all of that together? And let's look at the transfer system all together, rather than say is the tax code on its own progressive. Well, the tax code plus all the benefits that that tax code funds is that progressive and where are its disincentives so let's put that whole system together if you have a, a flatter tax code that that isn't so progressive but you use it to to give bernie sanders all the money he wants to write people's checks then the government as a whole can be as progressive as you like and i think that's incredible. simplify the tax code so it's only trying to raise money for the government at minimal economic distortion, not trying to redistribute income, not trying to subsidize my, my neighbor's Tesla in Palo Alto, $5 million house and his tax-supported Tesla in the front yard. What, what are we doing here? Raise money with the government with a flat, simple, transparent uh, consumption tax, and then write whatever checks you want. Now, write check, you know, appropriate them and write checks where you, me, and the other voters can say, yeah, Send that guy a check for his Tesla. Okay, if that's what the voters want, uh, that's fine. But look at the, you know, address inequality and opportunity and disincentives with, with the whole system together, not just the taxes at, at hand. It'd be great if we had some political leaders that would take a big picture view like that. I'm not sure where that's coming from today. I've talked to quite a few political leaders who, who understand this perfectly, <laughs> uh, but it, it's not a lack of knowledge. Now, first of all, it needs great leadership yes. to have a tax reform. 1986 was the last great yes. tax reform. And you got to bring everyone to the table and say, you're losing yours, you losing yours, you losing yours, but the rates will be low. The economy is going to grow. We're all going to benefit. So what I need you to do is not to come argue to restore your special deduction for this, that, and the other thing, but to come help me to stop the other guy from getting his special deduction and credit. So it... It needs knowledge. It needs leadership. But, uh, but I think that that is possible. Here's where I'm an optimist, not a cynic, not a grumpy. <laughs> I think that is still possible. You referenced it earlier, and we'd, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, 
the problems that First Republic has had. Uh, without question, Dodd-Frank added a whole lot of regulations to the banking system. Uh, and a lot of people, including you, have asked how the regulators missed some some pretty basic mistakes in decision making, particularly by uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Talk about that a little bit. And, and do you think that we're in need of an entirely different and new financial regulatory system? Yes. <laughs> and and this is one of the writings that I, that I hope you guys read when, when you gave me the prize. I've been thinking about the financial regulatory system. Look, these are elephants in the room. Silicon Valley Bank's failure is something that a undergraduate in the first week of a banking class would have said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> uh, it did not take any special fancy stuff to happen. Now, what went on here, I, I know people at the Fed and financial regulators, they're smart people and, and they get it, but they are stuck in a system with tens of thousands of pages of regulation that is simply uh, broken and that it couldn't see something so simple, so obvious. You couldn't see it, couldn't address it, couldn't do anything about it. That tells you this system is broke. We don't need another 10,000 pages of rules. Oh, you know, what if you X, Y, and Z? Uh, and this is not the first failure in, in the uh, pandemic. Our, the treasury market seized up in ways that academics had said for years, guys, these Dodd-Frank rules are not going to work. The treasury market's going to seize up. Seized up, Fed came in and started buying two thirds, three quarters of all the new issues of treasuries. The Fed money market funds, this money market funds are child's play to fix. My same undergraduate could fix money market funds. We bailed them out in Dodd-Frank, bailed them out again in the pandemic. The Fed issued a, a whatever it takes guarantee that corporate bond prices shall not fall. I mean, all basic, simple things and they, and they fell apart. What's the, the the answer is not add more regulations. And the answer is not wish for smarter people. The answer is that this basic idea is, is, is bust. And the basic idea is we're going to guarantee deposits to stop people from running, but then our regulator, now we have a now we have a huge disincentive problem. The banks are gambling with the government's money. Uh, so now we're going to let regulators go in and make sure that they don't that they don't uh, take too many risks. Well, that's like saying, Uncle Luigi, have my credit card, uh, go to Las Vegas, enjoy yourself. Oh, but here's the rules. Uh, you know, you don't get to uh, you don't get to double up on 17 and, you know, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> and, and the rule of the asset, if it couldn't see something so simple, give up. And, and the answer is quite simple also. Uh, banks need to, if you take deposits, you got to funnel it straight into treasuries or reserves. All your risky investments you need to fund with equity and long-term debt. Simply done, we end financial crises forever. Now, that's again, that's a big reform. Uh, and that takes a lot of getting people uh, getting to people see it. Although in this case, you just need to let the alternative emerge. The Fed has been stopping that alternative from emerging, not just uh, uh, regulating the big banks in a sensible way. But, you know, sooner or later, after we've tried everything else, doesn't America turn around and do the right thing, uh, both on taxes and on uh, financial regulation? That, that's the sense in which I'm, I'm hopeful as an economist. I think this is a moment where we're seeing the rot of the current system and that, that we are open to fundamental reforms. John, you've got a, a new book out, The Fiscal Theory of the Price Level, and there's a whole lot to explore, in it, including how government deficits and debt drive inflation. So let's talk about that in the context of the present day. How has the government contributed to the inflation that we've all suffered through in the last year? Uh, and, and what's the solution to bring it down? Uh, thank you. I, I am in some ways the luckiest economist in the world, and not, not just for winning a Bradley Prize. Uh, I wrote a book on, on how debt and deficits fundamentally are the cause of inflation. I turned in the manuscript uh, in uh, March of 2021 with an introduction that said, man, we haven't seen inflation since the Reagan era, but you know, someday you might care about this book, dust it off and take it down. And the book basically said, if you if you if you throw five trillion dollars of money out the window, you're going to get inflation. The government threw five trillion dollars of money out the window, and lo and behold, we got inflation. So uh, uh, I'm I'm very lucky. It's it's going to be good for book sales. I hope, as you know, the rest of the economy is unlucky, and I'm I'm sorry about that. But 
Uh, that's that's the way it is. So yes, uh, I'll st- you know every analysis comes from a theory. The fiscal theory, of the price level diagnoses the current situation as in the pandemic, the government vastly overdid it and literally printed up $3 trillion of money, borrowed another two, and sent people checks. And that would have been fine if they had said, look, this is a temporary borrowing. We're going to repay it. Here's how we're going to repay all this debt. But no, they said, you know, interest rates are less than growth rates, modern monetary theory. Don't worry about it. We don't have to worry about that anymore. So people get all this debt and they say, well, I have no plan for paying it back. I better spend it now while it's still good. And we got inflation. Uh, the Fed has, has a part to play in it. And I don't want to preview a you know, 550 page book. Uh, the Fed can has an influence on inflation, but fundamentally our inflation comes from fiscal policy and will have to be cured by getting uh, fiscal policy back on track. Thanks, John. One more question. What's it mean to you to win a Bradley Prize? Oh my God. This is such, it's a tremendous honor. I mean, I look at the list of previous Bradley Prize winners and I go, me in this club? <laughs> what did I do to deserve this? But but um, in my um, writing, especially my public policy writing, I never know if anybody's listening. You know, I write Wall Street Journal op-eds. I, I write a blog. Um, has anybody heard any of this? And and you're telling me they have. So it's it's not only humbling, it's not only a tremendous honor. It means that there's there's some small amount of impact that I've had, and it's a tremendous encouragement. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll now reveal the secret. I have as my next project to take a lot of this disparate stuff. You know, we've talked about taxes, banks, monetary policy. I, I want to write a, 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 a book on it and in, in, in I'm, I'm going to aim high to be sort of a new version of Milton Friedman's Free to Choose. It puts all these ideas together. And I did dare to think maybe when that one comes out, I, I might aspire to, to a Bradley Prize. Because, well, you're giving me the, the, the real encouragement that, that someone's listening and this is a worthy project. So I'll, I'll take the prize ahead of time and, and hope. Uh, and, but it's just, uh, it's just a tremendous encouragement that this, this has really been this project of, of thinking through in basic terms how we can reform our, our, our society, our economy, get back to prosperity and growth, uh, that this project has has some ears in, in you know, smart corners of the room like, like the Bradley Foundation and is, is worth pursuing harder. So I, I, I'm just amazingly thankful. Thank you very, very much and, and humbled and encouraged. Terrific. John Cochran, thanks so much for spending some time with us today. Thanks for your your great work and and for being a courageous voice. We, We need more of you out there. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of Conceived in Liberty. 